good today. I come against every distraction, anything, oh God, that will prohibit your word from going forth with power and persuasiveness. Do it for us, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say something nice to him. Make him smile real big. Come on, make him smile real big. Amen. Remain standing. Let's get right into the word. I'm itching to preach today. Um, the, the word is found in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. I'm grateful for all of our um, pastors and our sons and daughters in ministry. Uh, amen. None of them want to sit beside me today. All of them sitting together. Amen. Bless them, Lord. Amen. Our sons and daughters in ministry, the pulpit and the pew, members of our diaconate ministry. Come on, remain standing. Our choir ushers, our music ministry, rather, our ushers, uh, gatekeepers, media, all of you, nurses as well. We thank God for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, just one verse, uh, verse 18. 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's right before 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> Amen. 1 Thessalonians. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to look at verse uh, 18, just one verse um, today. And please keep your Bibles open. Let's read it together, uh, shall we? In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. One more time. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do me a favor. Turn to someone, look him or her in the eye and say, neighbor, whatever you're going through, thank him anyhow. That's what I want to preach about today. Thank him. Thank him anyhow. Thank him, thank him, thank him, thank him anyhow. Let's just, you may be seated in the very presence of, of the Lord. This morning, uh, my brothers and sisters, our sermonic spotlight uh, this morning shines on an excerpt from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica. Um, Paul penned this particular letter uh, from the city of Corinth between AD 50 and 52 with the sole intent of encouraging these believers to stand fast in the faith against imminent persecution. Throughout this particular letter, I want you to read it when you get home. Paul, uh, he does several things to encourage them. The first thing that he does in chapter 1, verse 6, is he commends them for receiving the word in great affliction. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says that you didn't get the word easy, but you received the word in great uh, affliction. That, that word affliction uh, in chapter 1 verse 6 in the Greek is thelipsis and it means under, under pressure. Uh, Roman persecution during biblical days included um, placing a huge boulder uh, on a criminal's chest and that boulder would literally squeeze the life out of them. Um, Paul, Paul says that when you got the word, uh, things in your life wasn't easy. You were under thalipsis. You were under a great deal of pressure. Something was squeezing the life out of you. But you still were able to receive the word, and he commended them for doing so. He encourages them, secondly, in chapter 2, verse 12, by charging them to walk worthy of the call of God who called them into the kingdom. And that word in uh, verse 12 of chapter 2, called is theleo in the Greek, uh, and it literally means to summon. It, it's, it's the same thought uh, of a shepherd calling his sheep and the sheep knowing the voice of the shepherd. Uh, Paul says, I want to uh, co commend you for uh, being called by God, that you, you didn't stop doing what you were doing on your own, um, but God called you into the kingdom, <laughs> um, that, that you just didn't leave um, the power of darkness and come into the marvelous light, um, but you had a calling on your life. Some of us might as well fess up uh, that it was the power of God that called us out. Uh, that we were, whatever we were in, we were enjoying it. We were too wrapped up, tied up, and tangled all up in it. And the only way that we were able to get out of it was not because we wanted to leave it, but because uh, God's call was greater than the devil's catch. <laughs> That, that he called us. So Paul says, I want to commend you that not only um, did you receive the word in great affliction, but I want to commend you for uh, walking worthy of God who called you. But then he says, thirdly, I want to commend you 
uh, in chapter 4, verse 4, I want to admonish you, rather, to continue to live a holy and set-aside life. Uh, in chapter 4, verse 4, um, Paul, walk with me, if you will. Paul says, I, 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 I'm, I'm charging that you would abstain from stuff, that you would live a holy and sanctified life. Someone shout sanctified. First time some of us have ever said that word, but uh, it means to be set aside. It, it, it means to be holy. God, God, Paul tells this church that God is calling for you to guard your vessel. Uh, guarding your vessel simply means that you can't do what everybody else do. I wish I can preach in this house that you can't go where everybody else go. Uh, some stuff is lawful but not expedient. <laughs> Uh, that, that as Christians, as children of God, that we're not called to blend in. Uh, we're called to stand out. Uh, that God didn't call us to be the world, but to be the salt of the world. Um, the salt uh, doesn't acquiesce to the food, but the food acquiesces to the salt. Uh, you don't go around saying that your salt tastes roast beefy, but you say your roast beef tastes salty. <laughs> and that the Lord says we are to be the salt. Can I preach this day? So, so he says, I want to commend you. I want to commend you, uh, number one, for um, receiving the word and great affliction. Two, for walking worthy of the calling. Three, I admonish you to live a holy and set aside life. But then fourthly, Paul encourages them to stay encouraged uh, because the Lord was coming back again. He says in chapter four through verse chapter four and five, um, he talks about the great hope of the Lord's return. Jesus is coming back. I, I wish I can say it in a way that you'd receive it. I said the Lord is coming back. I know that we've been hearing that over and over again and sometimes we don't hear it enough and we've getting comfortable down here but you need to know the Lord is coming back. And the Bible says when there's roars and rumors of wars it's a sign that the Lord is coming back when there's earthquakes and diverse places talk to me somebody or reader all of that is an harbinger or an indication that the Lord uh, is coming back mothers against daughters and fathers against sons help me somebody that tells me that the Lord nudge your neighbor say neighbor he is coming back and and so Paul he encourages this church on um, these four ways however uh, right before Paul concludes this letter um, to the church at Thessalonica he does something interesting um, Paul in verse 15 of chapter uh, 5 verse 16 of chapter 5 stay with me um, Paul gives the church um, a series of short uh, of, of short admonitions he he gives them seven um, divine mandates uh, he says seven things to the church beginning uh, at verse 16 through 22 uh, when you look at the tense the mood and the voice of these seven imperatives they are in the imperative mood Paul uh, is, is saying this is a command I'm in verse 16 the first thing that Paul says uh, that you gotta do in verse 16 he says uh, rejoice evermore Paul says please can I teach today Paul says that whatever um, you do you have to hold on to your joy uh, just tell somebody beside you keep your joy keep your joy and Paul tells the church rejoice uh, evermore your rejoicing is a byproduct of your joy Paul didn't tell them to be happy um, because happiness depends on something favorable uh, happening um, but when you have a joy, nothing good can happen and you can still praise the Lord because the joy of the Lord is your strength and the strength of the Lord is your joy. And that's why grandma and them used to say that the joy I have, the world didn't give it to me. Preach, pastor. And the world can't take it away. Tell somebody, hold on to your joy. You, you, you can't let nothing in circumstances and situations steal your joy because your joy is not in things. Your joy is not in creature comforts like cars, cribs, clothes, and cottages in the country. Um, but your joy is in something that money can't buy, thieves can't steal, water can't drown, fire can't burn. Uh, your joy is in Jesus. And as long as you have Jesus, you ought to have some. I wish I had a witness here. And if you have joy every now and then, you ought to rejoice. If you have joy every now and then, you ought to walk in church with a praise on your lips. Preach to me. If you have joy every now and then, you ought to lift your countenance. If you have joy, you ought to make up in your mind that the devil can't ruin what the devil didn't make. That if this is the day the Lord has made, you ought to rejoice 
and be glad. He tells them, he tells them in verse 16, he says, you gotta rejoice evermore. Look at verse 17, he says, the second thing uh, that you gotta do is what? Talk to me, pray without ceasing. Paul says, don't stop praying. Can the church shout, don't stop praying. Paul says, listen, whatever you're going through, uh, don't stop praying. Don't let pressure make you stop praying. Don't let problems make you stop praying. Don't let persecution make you stop praying. Don't let your peril make you stop praying. Don't let your plight make you stop praying. In fact, those things ought to make you pray even the more because James says it is the fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous that avail. nothing Bernard moves the hand of God faster than prayer. Give me a prayer warrior any day because prayer Prayer can do stuff that you can't do. Prayer can open doors that you can't open. Prayer can move mountains that you can't move. Preach, boy. Prayer can go farther than the car in the driveway. Open more doors and the keys in your pocket. Uh, prayer does three things. Goes up to heaven. Goes down to hell. Goes out to humanity. It goes up to bless heaven. Goes out to build humanity. Goes down to block hell. All at the same time. Uh, if you pray, God will answer your prayer. In fact, the only reason why somebody here has survived the hell that you survived was because you had a praying mama. The only reason somebody here survived all of the stress and the strain and the drama that you had to go through is because while you were hanging out, somebody was bending their knees saying, Lord, bless my crazy child. God, keep your eyes on it. Am I talking to anybody? Paul says, pray. Can I go a little bit farther? Skip down to verse 19. Paul says, uh, don't quench the spirit. Uh, quen that word quench, I feel like teaching this morning. That word quench, uh, in the Greek, it means to hinder, it means to stop. Paul says, don't handcuff the Holy Ghost. Paul says, let the spirit have his way. Not it, but his way. The spirit, y'all, is not an it. But the Holy Spirit, can I teach this morning, uh, is the third person in the Trinity. You have God who made us, Jesus who redeemed us, but the Holy Spirit is he who said, sustains us. You have God above us, Jesus who was with us and the Holy Ghost inside uh, of, uh, are y'all with me today? Uh, uh, the three make one, like an apple have three parts, uh, the skin, the hull, uh, and the core. That's how God the Father is. He's God the Father, he's God the Son, and he's God uh, the Holy Ghost. Uh, and we have to learn how not to quench the Holy Ghost. Every now and then, I tell my ushers, uh, don't start fanning folk uh, when folks start shouting. They need to burn. You you ain't fan them in the club when they got hot in the club. You said, uh, uh, come on, the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. We don't need no water. Let the believer, the believer, the believer burn. Well, don't be fanning in the church. When the Holy Ghost is starting to move, don't quench the spirit. <laughs> I wish y'all let me preach up in this house today. He, he says, don't handcuff the Holy Ghost. Don't, don't, don't quench the spirit. Verse number 20, Paul said, can I read, can I walk the text? I'm in verse 20. Verse 20, he says, don't despise prophesying. That word prophesying in the Greek, uh, it refers to forth telling. It refers uh, um, to preaching. It refers uh, to preaching and predicting. Paul says that do not get to the point in your life where you despise the value of the voice of the Lord. Paul says, uh, all Always have an appreciation for the word of God. Can I park there and mention parenthetically that we need the word of God. God. You, yes, you don't have to be to go to church to be saved, but you ought to come to church because you need a word from the Lord. Yes, you can read your Bible at home, but you know what? You ought to come to church to get a word from the Lord. Yes, come on, help me somebody. You can watch it on TV, but you ought to get up in the morning, and get dressed, and come to church to get a word from the Lord because just one word can turn your situation around. How many times have you been on the cross roles of indecision and have come to church and got a word from the Lord. How many times have you been on the verge of throwing in the towel and hadn't talked to the preacher? However, he opened up his mouth and began talking to you and you felt like he was reading your email. How many times have you come to church after crying all night long and come to church and the preacher reminded you that your tears were temporary, that weeping endure for a night, but joy comes. Am I talking to somebody? Tell your neighbor, I need a word 
word from the Lord. And because I need a word from the Lord, when I come to church, I don't have time to sit beside somebody who's going to be talking to me about current events. I don't need to have sit beside somebody who's going to be talking to me about who's sleeping with who. I can care less who's sleeping with who. I didn't come for foolishness. I came because the devil has been on my track. He's been trying to kill my joy, trying to steal my children. I came to church. Is there a word from the Lord? God, I feel like preaching. I haven't even got to my text. Sit down. He, 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 says, he says in verse 16, he says, rejoice evermore. Verse 17, he says, pray without ceasing. Verse 19, he says, don't quench the spirit. Verse 20, he says, despise, not prophesying. But look at verse 21. He says, prove all things. Can the church shout, prove all things? That word prove in the Greek, it literally means to test. Can I teach this morning, Bernard? It means to test. It means don't take a person's word for it. And Paul says, uh, try it uh, before you buy it. Paul says, test it, just don't take it. Paul says, prove all things. Why? Because everybody that comes to church is not saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Prove all things because everybody that claim to be a preacher and a prophet uh, is really not a preacher and a prophet. Uh, Prove all things because the devil can wear a cross. The devil can carry a Bible. The devil can quote the scripture. Uh, Y'all ain't got to say amen. We got wolves every Sunday that come to church dressed up like sheep. And Paul says, uh, instead of taking their word for it, uh, you better prove it because uh, somebody right now, you got your feelings hurt by somebody in the church uh, who you thought was a man of God. Listen, boo, just because he go to church don't mean he's saved. The, The devil goes to church. Tell your neighbor, you better prove it. You better prove it. Prove to me you know God. Prove to me you're saved. Prove to me you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Prove to me. Prove it. Can I help somebody today? (laughs) I'm not even at my text. In in verse 16, he says, keep your joy. In, in, In verse 19, he says, don't stop praying. In verse, in, in verse, in verse uh, 17, he says, don't stop praying. Uh, in verse 19, he says, don't handcuff the Holy Ghost. In verse 21, he says, value the voice. In verse 21, he says, test it, don't take it. In verse 22, he says, abstain, watch this, from the what? No, he didn't say abstain from evil. It says abstain from what? The appearance of evil. Paul says, listen, just don't abstain from evil, uh, but abstain from that which looks like evil. In other words, uh, Paul says, uh, before you find out whether they're an evil or not, if they look evil, stay away from it. Uh, Paul says, uh, before you even get close to it, uh, if it looks fishy, if it smells fishy, it's probably fish. Paul says, uh, shun the appearance of evil. Gosh, I feel like preaching today. And to be honest with y'all, as I get to my text, Carter, when I read all seven imperatives, Denise, I really didn't have a problem with the first two because I understood about rejoicing evermore and I understood about praying without ceasing. I didn't have a problem with number four through seven because I understood about quenching not the spirit and despising not prophesying and proving all things and abstaining from um, the appearance of evil. But the one I struggled with, Reese, was number three. I struggled with verse 18 because verse 18 says in... Man, I I, I struggled. I, I struggled. With, with that third imperative, because Paul says, in everything, give thanks. I, I, I struggled with that word, everything. Lord, let me preach, because everything includes the good. Y'all ain't talking to me in this house. 
Everything includes when I got money and when I'm broke. Everything includes when my child does well in school and when my child gets locked up. Everything includes when I'm healthy in my body and when I got cancer in my body. Everything includes when I'm facing high mountains and when I ain't facing no mountains. And I struggled with that thing, everything. Can I tell you what everything includes? Everything includes the conversation I had last night with Larry Mumford who called me saying to me that him and his wife was on vacation, Gail, and his wife got sick on the cruise and, and suffered a heart attack and suffered a severe stroke. And it was so severe that the Coast Guard had to come um, to the plane, to the cruise ship, and airlift her to the Keys. And when she got to the Keys, the hospital said her condition was so bad, they airlifted her a second time from the Keys to Jackson Trauma Center. And last night was in a five-hour surgical procedure on her brain. Everything included the text I got yesterday about, uh, about uh, Zachary Evans' mother who was placed the hospice. Everything includes the massacre in Colorado when a crazy man went in there and killed 12 of folk. Everything includes members who were diagnosed with cancer. I've struggled. How can I praise God with everything? Because the truth of the matter is there are some times when I go through hell. Yes, I go through hell. There are some times when I'm crying. I don't feel like praising the Lord. I don't feel like coming to church. Yes, Pastor Jackson, I don't feel like walking in church, throwing up my hands but the text says I got no choice even when things are going wrong in everything and Nikki here's the question how Lord help me preach how do I give thanks in everything I wish I was talking to somebody who really needed to know that well, 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 if you need to know that you, you, you're in the right place, but because Paul said, let me help you, Pastor Jackson. Let me, let, let me tell you how to give thanks in everything. He says, sit down. He says, if you're going to give thanks in everything, number one, you got to know something. Number one, Pearl, you got to know, here it is, that everything happens with the involvement of God. Repeat that with me. Say, everything happens with the involvement of God. It, n nothing happens without God being involved in it. I wish I had a praying church. Nothing can happen to you without God being involved in it. When I looked at verse 18, I was struggling, Lori, with the word everything. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Pastor Jackson, you're struggling because you're focused on the wrong word in verse 18. The Holy Spirit says the key word in verse 18 is not the word everything, but the key word is the word in. The text doesn't say thank him for everything. The text says thank him in everything, meaning we don't thank God for the cancer. We thank God in the cancer. We don't thank God for the layoff. We thank God in the layoff. We don't thank God for the massacre. We thank God in the massacre. We don't thank God for the divorce. We thank God in the divorce. We don't thank God. God for the bankruptcy. We thank God in the bankruptcy. We don't thank God for the struggle. We thank God in the struggle. We don't thank God for the pressure. We thank God in the pressure because in every situation, God is right there in the midst. I wish you would tell your neighbor, neighbor, as bad as it is, God is right there in it. As bad as it is, he's right. Help me somebody. He's in everything. Okay, 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 you're looking at me like I'm lost. Let me see if I can help you. Uh, my favorite verse, Brother Borkins, uh, in the Bible uh, is Romans chapter 8, verse 28. In, in fact, I love Romans 8, 28, but I love reading it from the New International Translation of the Bible. So look on the screens very quickly, and let's, let, me, let me just exegete this one verse. Uh, look at what the text says. The text says, um, and we know that what? Oh, 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 oh. And, 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 and we know that, that in all things, God, God stop right there. In, in, and, and we know, keep it on the screen. And we know in, in all things, um, um, God, point one, um, God is existing 
in all things. Write that down. He's existing uh, in all things. And we know that in all things, uh, God, God is in all things. Come on, let me tell you what the words. In all things, uh, God, God in all things. In, in everything, God is existing in all things. Pastor, how do you know God is existing in all things? When, when a crazy man walked into a movie theater and killed uh, 12 people, well, I know he's in that thing because uh, he had more bullets. He had guns. He only killed 12. If God wasn't in that thing, he would have killed everybody in the movie theater. How do I know God uh, is in that situation with Sister Mumford? Because when she came out of surgery, the doctor said it was successful. How do you know God uh, is in that situation? I know he's in it because guess what? Uh, you woke up this morning and it didn't take you out. How do I know God is in your situation? Because as bad as it is, early this morning God touched you with a finger of love. He allowed you to wake up and not only did you wake up, you came to church with a praise on your lips. If God wasn't in it, you would have committed suicide. If God wasn't in it, you would have phone in the towel. Can somebody right now give somebody a high five and says, neighbor, yes, I got to cry, but God is in this thing. Yes, I got to suffer, but God is in this thing. Yes, I'm catching hell, but God is in this thing. Yes, I'm struggling, but God is in this thing. And because his presence is in it, I praise him in it because there's a correlation between my praise in this thing and his presence in this thing. And that's why the haters and my enemies are confused because my enemies think I ought to be having a pity party. But I don't flip the script on those rascals and I'm having a praise party because you don't see who I got in this thing with me. Help me, somebody. That was the mistake that King Nebuchadnezzar made. He made the mistake. He thought he only threw in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the next morning, he recognized that there was a fourth person who had crept in that situation with him and they were learning and praising the Lord and here's the chance to give God praise. When Nebuchadnezzar brought them out of the fiery furnace the Bible says their hair was not burned, their clothes was not scorched and they didn't even smell like smoke. Can you give somebody a high five and tell your neighbor, neighbor I don't smell like what I've been through because God has been in this thing with me. Can you give your neighbor a high five and tell him I don't look like what I've been in because God's been in it with me. Can you give God crazy praise and tell somebody he's been right there all the time. He's in this thing with me. Sit down. Oh God, I feel like preaching today. Sit down. And if you're going to thank God, can I preach tonight? If you're going to thank God, anyhow, you got to know everything. Someone shout everything. Everything happens with God's involvement. But not only does everything happen, watch this, with God's involvement. Everything happens by the intention of God. It happens with God's intention. Nothing happens by accident. In fact, I need you to get this today. Repeat this with me. Say, everything happens by the intention of God. Listen, God does not make mistakes. God, I wish I could preach to somebody in this house. There are no accidents with God. There are no coincidences with God. Gwen, the text says, for this is the will of Paul says, in everything, give thanks for this definite article pointing to the action that just took place. For this is the will. I, I want to take, I, I want to take, sit down, I want to take about five minutes and I want to explain the will of God clearly. Because I was watching Fox the other night. And it became apparent to me, listen to George Crazy Man Zimmerman, that everybody don't understand the will. Somebody will catch that if you know me. So I want to take about five, ten minutes, and I want to talk about the will of, 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 of God. In Wayne Grudem's 
book on systematic theology, he, he talks about the four wheels of God. Somebody better write this down. He, he says that God has at least four wheels. He says that God has a necessary will. He has a free will. He has a revealed will. And he has a secret preach boy. He, he said that God has four wills, that God has a necessary will, that God has a free will, God has a revealed will, and God has a secret will. He says the necessary will of God includes uh, that which God must will according to his own nature. He explained that the necessary will of God is the will expressed that makes God God be God. For example, he says that God must will to love us because love is who God is. That God has no choice in willing to love us because that will express the very nature of who God is. So when J. Moss sings my favorite song, he loves us in the good and in the bad, he's talking about the necessary will of God. We ought to praise God for that. Because when God loves us, he's not loving us because we are lovable. He is loving us because that's his necessary will. He has no choice but to love us. He hates what we do, but he loves us because that's a part of his will. Have I got a witness here? Secondly, he talks about the free will of God. The free will of God includes, don't miss this, the things that God decides to will to us, but he's not obligated to do so. In other words, the free will of God are all those things that God didn't have to will to us, but he decided to will to us anyway. For example, he willed to wake us up this morning, but didn't have to do it. He willed to bless us even though we were so undeserving. He wills to reign on the just as well as the unjust. He wills to give you a car that your credit didn't qualify for. He wills to let you live in houses that your background didn't prepare you for. He wills to give you a job that you're unqualified to do. You ought to praise God for the free will of God because us in his free will. Uh, he decides to bless you anyhow. I wish I was talking to somebody who was just blessed anyhow. And sometimes uh, folk hate on you because of the favor. Listen, don't hate on me uh, because God decided in his free will to give me favor because favor just ain't fair. The free will of God. He talks about the necessary will of God. Secondly, he talks about the free will of God. But thirdly, he talks about the revealed will of God. The revealed will of God is God's will that's contained in his commandments. It is his will that's found in his precedent, pre precepts. It is his will that's found in the word of God. Oftentimes you've heard the phrase, his will is in his word. Every time you hear that phrase, it's referring to the revealed will of God. Meaning, if you ever want to know what God's will is for your life, just read the Bible. Because God packs his will inside of his word. Many folk don't know God's will because you don't read God's word. Show me a person that don't know God's will. I'll show you a person that don't read God's word. But if you read God's word, consequently, you'll read up on God's will because God concealed his will in his word. But then there's another will of God and this is the will we struggle with we don't struggle with the necessary will of God we don't struggle with the free will of God we don't struggle with the revealed will of God but Isla it is that secret will of God that messes us up because the secret will of God is that will that's revealed over time the secret will of God is the will of God that we oftentimes don't understand the secret will of God is that will that grandmama used to say will understand it better yeah, she was talking about the secret will of God. The secret will of God is his will that comes disguised in disappointment, that comes hidden in hurt, that comes packaged in pain. It comes bagged in bereavement. The secret will of God is that will that we struggle to understand. But my assignment this morning is to let you know that if we're going to thank him anyhow, we have to remember that everything happens to us according to the intent of God. It happens to us either by his necessity 
necessary will, his free will, his revealed will, or his secret will. And our job is not to try to unravel the will, but our job is to weather the will. If God has willed it, we can weather it. No matter what his will is for your life, you got to have the confidence of knowing he will never put more on you than you are able to bear. Can you turn to your neighbor and look him or her in the eye and say, neighbor, if God willed it, you can weather it. If he willed for you to cry, you can weather the tears. If he willed for you to have cancer, you can weather the chemotherapy. If he willed for you to get laid off, you can weather the unemployment. If he willed for you to go through this season some kind of way, he will weatherproof you. I wish I had a weatherproof saint in the building that knew that whatever you had to go through, you everything will be all right. Can you slap five with somebody close and tell them, neighbor, you can handle this? Lest I hold you too long, Paul says, if you're going to thank him anyhow, you have to know that everything, someone shout everything. Everything happens with the involvement of God. I wish I had a praying church. That there needs nothing can happen without God stamping his seal of approval on it. Why? Because he's in everything. Because Romans 8, 28 says in everything, God, he's existing. That God, he's exercising. <laughs> that God, he's executing. I left that part out. In Romans 8, 28, everything that God is executing, God is existing, and God is exercising. He, he's at work. He's exercising for the good. He's executing. God is at work. God is in everything. But not only does everything happen with the intention of God, everything happens with the involvement of God. But then Paul says we can praise him anyhow because everything happens for the interest of God. Repeat that. Say everything happens for the interest of God. Paul says in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Here it is concerning you in everything. Lord, let me preach. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. God is interested in us. That, that, that phrase, concerning you, simply means that God has high regard for us. That, that, that we are the interest of God. I know you've been talking to your neighbor all day, but tell him one more time, God is interested in you. In, in, in fact, God is so interested in you that God is crazy. In fact, God loves you. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but somebody needed to know that if nobody else loves you, Lord, let me preach. God sure enough loves you. I'll try one more time. If nobody else loves you, you need to know, baby, that God sure enough loves you. That, that, that God is interested in you. In fact, he, 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 he's so concerned about you that God has already factored some stuff into, into the equation. He, he's already factored in your strength. In fact, God, he, he knows what you can handle because God, he knows how strong you are. And because he knows how strong you are, God has provided us with his strength. In fact, tell your neighbor, you got his strength. And, and see, you see, the devil is counting on you operating in your own power. The devil is counting on you operating in your own might. The devil is operating on you, uh, operating on your own strength and power. But Paul prayed to the church at Colossae, and Paul prayed and says, I'm praying that you walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. He says in verse 11, I'm praying that you are strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. In other words, Paul says, I'm praying that when you face what you have to face. You're not facing it in your own power, but you're facing it with his strength. And I came to serve notice to somebody today that you can praise him anyhow because you're not going through what you're going through on your own power. You're going through with the power of the Holy Ghost. In fact, that's why somebody has your haters totally confused because they think you would have thrown in the towel by now. They think you would be having a pity party by now. They think you would have waved the white flag by now. They think you were the throne in the towel by now, but every time you got on the verge of throwing in the towel, God kicked in his power and you hung on in there. In fact, tell your neighbor, neighbor, hang on in there. 
Because God has provided his strength. And not only has God provided his strength. Secondly, God has provided his supply. That he's so concerned about you that God has given you his supply. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi and said, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. In other words, I don't have to worry about how I'm going to make it because I have God's supply. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to go from day to day because I have God's supply. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to pay my bills because I have God's supply. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to feed my children because I have God's supply. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to pay child care because I have God's supply. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to send my child to college because I have God's supply. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to live from day to day because I have God's supply. I lean over and tell somebody beside you, tell a neighbor, I have God's supply. I wish I had a praying church when I brought a witness with me. Come here, woman from Zarephath. And she said, yes, Pastor Jackson, I can testify right here because there was a time in my life I was living from check to check. In fact, all I had was a little bit of meal in a barrel. And I was going to lay down and fix my last meal and die. But I heard the man of God come by my house one night. And, and he told me if I put God first, everything would be all right. He told me if I made his cake first, uh, that every time I put my hand in the barrel, food would be there. And it sounds self-serving. It sounds kind of crazy. It sounds illogical. But I concluded uh, I had nothing to lose. And what I did was uh, I decided to take God at his word. I fixed his cake first. Uh, and every time I put my hand in the barrel, God added something. Am I talking to somebody here? If, I'm, if that's your testimony, lean over and tell your neighbor he's talking about me. Because every time I put God first, some kind of way, he made a way out of no way. He's talking about me now. Because every time I turn around, some kind of way, he provides for me. That the Lord is so concerned, he's provided me with his strength. He's provided me with his supply. But he's provided me with his son. The Bible says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Stop right there. And the son loved me so much so that while I was yet in sin, he died for a wretch like me. He died on a hill called Calvary. He died in between two Two thieves, one thief on the left and one thief on the right and Jesus in the middle had one thief dying in sin one thief dying out of sin but Jesus dying for sin one sinner dying on the cross one sin dying to be crossed but Jesus he's dying in the middle of the cross uh, connecting humanity he died he died until the world will interrupt he died until the sun refused to shine he died until the devils started rejoicing and the angels started crying he died until the s are you in didn't shine because the S O N had died. He died. Didn't he die? And he was buried in a new tomb. But early Sunday morning, he got up with power in his hand. Do me a favor. Find a praise partner and tell your neighbor. Tell a neighbor he's concerned about me and because everything happens with the involvement of God because everything happens by the intent of God because everything is happening for the interest
face of God and learn how to thank him and learn how to praise him and learn how to glorify him. It's rough, but I praise him. It's hard, but I praise him. It's lonely sometimes, but I praise him. Got to cry sometimes, but I praise him. If I'm talking to you, lean over for the last time and tell somebody, tell a neighbor, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be in my mouth. Do I have a praise partner? Do I have somebody who can tell the devil, nah, 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 nah. I'll praise him anyhow, anyhow. Put those hands together. In the house, do I have any house praises? Do I have an any house praises? Do I have somebody who can praise him? Listen, listen, please don't miss the message. Give thanks in all things, in everything. Come on, I did, you, just because you don't know what the person is going through beside you. Their daddy could be sick, mama could be sick, child could be in trouble, relationship could be in trouble, finances can be tough. Can you put your arms around somebody? And just say, anyhow, anyhow. Come on, come on, do me a favor. Come on, help me. Come on, you ain't doing it. Minister to somebody. Put your arms around somebody and say, thank him anyhow. Thank you, you Lord. Come on. Thank you come Lord I wanna I wanna thank you hallelujah oh yes oh yeah I Oh, God. 
Jesus! 